I'm Cody Robert Judy, and this is a voice crying in the wilderness. Today is uh, August 29th. It's a Wednesday. I'm running for U.S. Senate in Utah as a write-in candidate. You won't see my name on the ballot, but you can write me in as a choice. Cody Judy, C-O-D-Y, J-U-D-Y. The word of the Lord came to me and if I was to title this video, I would title it after what the Lord called the uniqueness of Utahns. Utah is one of the most beautiful and diverse states I've ever been in. I mean, it, it ranges from the beautiful mountains and rivers, clear down to the red rocks and the deserts and plateaus. There's almost literally every facet of God's creations here in the state that you can imagine. It's actually one of the most beautiful places on earth, in my opinion. I love it. I graduated from Box Elder High School and graduated from Utah State Uni University in Logan, Utah. So a lot of my education has come here, but I've lived in a lot of different states in my life. I've lived in Arizona, California, Idaho, New Jersey, Ohio, And I've traveled almost every single state in the Union, either in golf or horse showing. So it's been a real unique opportunity in my life to travel and run around the United States of America. I've even been to Hawaii, went there on my honeymoon. <laughs> One of them. As I thought about this word the Lord gave me in a dream, the uniqueness of Utahns. Not so much the uniqueness of Utah as far as a state, but the uniqueness of Utahns. It's very specific. And I thought, you know, you just can't speak about Utahns without a little memory coming in and pressing for the pioneers that came over here from great persecution. They had a extermination order handed out in Governor Boggs order extermination meaning to expel get them out of the state and a pilgrimage was made for a place to worship God to the dictates of their own conscience. Something that we hope is revered in the United States of America under the United States Constitution in freedom of religion. 
just like freedom of the press, freedom of speech, freedom to assemble in the First Amendment. That is a beautiful thing, but it's also threatened. When you ask yourselves what is unique about Utahns, of course, Mormons come to mind. says, woe be unto those who will make an, a man an offender for a word, especially those or one standing at the gate in reproof. This is the Book of Mormon. That is printed by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints makes up over half, or very close to over half, of the state of Utah, as far as the uniqueness of Utahns. Now, it used to be that The Utahns, especially the Mormons, were probably one of the greatest defenders of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to assemble, freedom of the press. But now I think that's threatened. And I'm out here in the wilderness running for office, U.S. Senate. There's some other choices out there. And I don't even know if Utahns will ever even hear of my candidacy from the press. The LDS church has become one of the richest churches. I mean, you could say per capita, but that has to do with faithfulness. And you, you can't knock faithfulness. I mean, who doesn't want faithfulness. God wants faithfulness to him. He's the teacher of 
wanting faithfulness and wanting obedience. He gives us commandments to, to live and not just to talk about. He didn't say just, just talk about the commandments and don't live them. You know, he said, preach them and do them. I went to prison for 3,018 days for disrupting an, a meeting held by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints called the Fireside. And my word at that Fireside was a reproving word from the Lord Jesus Christ. And he talked about three things. that the church leaders, but more specifically, it applies to every individual in that church. And I was given that word and told that it was the uniqueness of Utahns in that faith that made them worthy of the chastisement of the Lord worthy of the hope of Zion, worthy of the correction of the Almighty God and our Creator. The Book of Mormon, in a nutshell, just like the Bible, is a record or a history, a history of a people Yes, it contains religious principles of faith and hope and courage and belief, but it also contains a, a record of wars and contentions of wars in the political kingdoms. And this is what the Lord has given to me to talk about, specifically called the gospel of the kingdom. The Lord's prayer, like our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come. Not necessarily the church, the kingdom. Speaking of the political. The political always affects more than just the church. It affects an entire state. I understand perfectly that. The other thing is the, the kingdom here in the United States of America is made up of citizens who actually have a vote. And a, a say so that's counted. And that's done in the privacy of a voting booth. But in a nutshell, you can even say that the Book of Mormon is a story about the Republicans and Democrats. It's a story of two differences of opinion. How a righteous people became wicked how they forsake and forsook the commandments of the Lord and were turned over to themselves, turned over to a, a certain destruction that ultimately wiped them completely out. Their loss was lamented by righteous men they called prophets of the Lord Jesus Christ or messengers of his word. Messengers that had hoped and prayed and preached that the people would turn away from their wickedness and that they would be one 
in the hope and the word and delight of the Lord Jesus Christ, who would fight their battles for them and preserve them in his beautiful strength, in his beautiful shield under his wing. It's always been my hope too. You know, the three things that I talked about or were the message at the Marriott Center, a word of correction given to me by the Lord. Number one was the word of wisdom was being perverted because it was supposed to, and it was given by the Lord, which stated adapted to the weak, to the weakest of all saints in section 89 of Doctrine and Covenants. And then also, the, the church turned away from polygamy. And the adoption of plurality of wives that encapsulated basically the greater fruits of beautiful homes for children led by men of God. Who were leaders in their households. A lot of people remember that the most about the Mormons, but it's not a foreign doctrine to the Bible. In fact, it's repeated over and over, even by Moses, even by Abraham. It was practiced by Adam, David, Solomon. And the world has perverted a beautiful doctrine there. The Lord gave understanding that 60% of the world came coming down from heaven was female and 40% were men and 20% of those got knocked out with war and shorter lifespan so the Lord the Lord understood uh, the principles of plurality and when the leaders of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints began to be incarcerated based solely on their desire to take care of their children and take care of their wives. Those leaders abandoned that doctrine, which was a principle of the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. practiced by all the large P prophets, even in the Bible. You cannot say that it was not, for there is a record and it's understood very well. A lot of people pervert that doctrine in the Bible. The Lord Jesus Christ, even his own words said, I have not come to destroy the law, I have come to fulfill the law. And his own church, while his ministry existed on the earth, incorporated those principles. The other principle that was incorporated in the true church set up by Jesus Christ while he walked the earth in his ministry was the principle we call united order where you don't have rich and poor but all contribute to one and then all have their needs taken care of. The doctor was not say over the farmer. The lawyer was not say over the electrician or plumber. It's always been the perversion of the law that got societies in trouble. 
Now I'm just here, I'm just a voice crying in the wilderness. I don't know if anybody's gonna hear me or not, but my record is true and to God. And God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you have to say the gospel and the fullness of the gospel is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So those three things for Utah to become a state, the Edmund Tucker Act was passed that prohibited polygamy. Yet the men in Washington, D.C. who passed that son of a bitch and thing still went ahead with their affairs, their mistresses, their secret combinations done in the dark, perverting the ways of the Lord into what we call the precepts of men. And in a, an attempt or a, some kind of need to avoid incarceration and get the church on the feet, the leaders decided to agree to that and they became the persecutors of polygamy. And the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints fights polygamy almost harder than any other state. Truly, the head has began to eat the tail. You've probably seen the, or heard about that TV series, this uh, Sister Wives. Cody's spelled with a K. He's got four wives and they fled Utah amidst the threat of being persecuted. And they went to Nevada, and then a recent story just came out where they bought land there in uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, where the government actually acknowledges there that though he's only married to one woman, the three others he's what they call spiritually married to, not legally married, he's just with them. Utah would prosecute that as. A sin or a, a uh, violation of law. So truly Utah has become a persecution of polygamy, a persecution of taking care of women and children. And that's sad. And that's all build up for the glory and to be looked and seen by other men as righteous. The precepts of man, not the precepts of God. The same took place in the days of Abraham, which I have seen, which was necessary for Abraham, Jacob and Isaac Abraham practiced the plurality of women through the office of the concubine. A great and holy office unto the Lord, represented as I have seen and witnessed, as a great big, in the shape of a great big U that was probably eight feet tall and maybe seven feet wide, probably about two to three feet thick in diameter as a ruby. If you can picture that, a great big U that big as a jewel crown of the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven surrounded and encased by diamonds. You'd understand the the glory of that office to the Lord. It's 
not a perversion. It's an honor. Great honor. It comes with great blessings. The Lord made nations out of the office of the concubine. To call all that evil is just sick. Insane. Rebellious. It's actually insidious. And it certainly is an oppression on the choice of women nowadays. Imagine if women had a choice of the men that were married already. And they could live in a millionaire's home, be taken care of, and have her children taken care of. Live in the beautiful home where principles of the gospel were taught. Breaks my heart to see the envy and the pride that has entered the hearts of those who would call themselves saints. Saints. It's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Saints. They call themselves saints of the Lord Jesus Christ. They speak of the words, but their hearts are far from the Lord. It's the saddest thing ever. It's the saddest thing in history. It's the true definition of hypocrisy. And doing that under the Lord, Lord's name the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, who died for our sins, just heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps the indignation of the Lord upon them. So it's no wonder that they would receive a correction and a chance to repent. I carry this talk with me because I was so impressed with it when I heard it and also when I read it. I actually shrunk it down and carry it in my scriptures. It's by President of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Ezra Taft Benson. It was found in the Enzyme May issue of 1989. And I want to read it because it's so profound. I hope I have time. My beloved brethren and sisters, I rejoice to be with you in another glorious general conference of the church. How grateful I am for the love, prayers, and service of the devout members of the church throughout the world. I commend you faithful saints who are striving in the, to flood the earth and your lives with the Book of Mormon. Not only must we move forward in a monumental manner more copies of the Book of Mormon and I'll say the Book of Mormon certainly been flooded it is now the fifth highest selling book on the on the in history on the earth but we must move boldly forward into our own lives and throughout the earth more of its marvelous messages this sacred volume was written for us for our day its scriptures are to be likened unto ourselves. See 1 Nephi 1923. The sin of pride. The Doctrine and Covenants tells us that the Book of Mormon is the record of a fallen people. Why did they fall? This is one of the major messages of the Book of Mormon and I certainly agree with that. Mormon gives the answers in the closing chapters of the book in these words. Behold, the pride of this nation, or the people of the Nephites, 
hath proven their destruction. Moroni 827. And then, lest we miss the monumentous Book of Mormon message from the fallen people, the Lord warns us in the Doctrine and Covenants, Beware of pride, lest ye become as the Nephites of old. D&C 3839. I earnestly seek an interest in your faith and prayers as I strive to bring forth light on this Book of Mormon message, the sin of pride. The message has been weighing heavily on my soul for some time, and I know the Lord wants this message delivered now. Beware. I don't know if I'm going to make it through this. <coughs> Beware. Beware of pride. In the <coughs> in the premortal council, it was pride that failed Lucifer, a son of the morning. Second Nephi, twenty four twelve fifteen. See also D and C seventy six twenty five to twenty seven. Moses four three. At the end of this world, when God cleans the earth by fire, the proud will be burned, will be burned as stubble, and the meek shall inherit the earth. 3rd Nephi 12.5, 25.1, D&C 29.9. Joseph Smith History 137, Malachi 4.1. Three times in the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord uses the phrase, Beware of pride, including a warning to the second elder of the church, Oliver Cowdery, and to Emma Smith, the wife of the prophet. DNC 23 1, DNC 25 14, 38 and 39. God's definition of pride. Pride is very misunderstood sin, and many are sinning in ignorance. Mosiah 3 11, 3 Nephi 6 18. In the scripture, there's no such thing as righteous pride. It is always considered a sin. Therefore, no matter how the world uses the term, we must understand how God uses the term so we can understand the language of the Holy Writ and Prophet thereby. Most of us think of pride as self-centeredness, conceit, boastfulness, arrogance, or haughtiness. All of these are clements of the sin, but the heart or core is still missing. The central feature of pride is enmity enmity toward God and enmity toward our fellow man. Enmity means hatred toward, hostility to, or a state of opposition. It is the power of which Satan wishes to reign over us. When pride has a hold on your hearts, we lose our independence of the world and deliver our freedoms to the bondage of men's judgments or judgment. The world shouts louder than the whisperings of the Holy Ghost. The reasoning of men overrides the revelations of God, and the proud let go of the iron rod. Manifestations of pride. Pride is a sin that can readily be seen in others, but is rarely admitted in ourselves. Most of us consider pride to be a sin of those on the top, such as the rich and the learned, looking down at the rest of us. There is, however, a far more common ailment among us, and that is pride from the bottom looking up. It is a manifest in so many ways, such as fault-finding, gossiping, backbiting, uh, murmuring, living beyond our means, envying, coveting, withholding gratitude and praise that might lift another, and being unforgiving and jealous. Disobedience is essentially a prideful, powerful power struggle against someone in authority over us. It can be a parent, a priesthood leader, a teacher, or ultimately God. A proud person hates the fact that someone is above him. He thinks this lowers his position. Selfishness is one of the more common faces of pride. How everything affects me is the center of all that matters. Self-conceit, self-pity, worldly self-fulfillment, self-gratification, and self-seeking. Pride results in secret combinations which are built up to get power, gain, and glory of the world. This fruit of the sin of pride, namely secret combinations, brought down both the Jaredite and the Nephite civilizations and has been and will yet be the cause of the fault of many nations. 
Another face of pride is contention, arguments, fights, unrighteous dominion, generation, generation gaps, divorce, divorces, spouse abuse, riots and disturbances of all into this category of pride. Contention in our families drives the Spirit of the Lord away. It also drives many of our family members away. Contention ranges from a hostile spoken word to worldwide conflicts. The scriptures tell us that only by pride cometh contention. The scriptures testify that the proud are easily offended and hold grudges. They withhold forgiveness to keep another in their debt and to justify their injured feelings. The proud do not receive counsel or correction easily. Defensiveness is used by them to justify and rationalize their frailties and failures. The proud depend upon the world to tell them whether they have value or not. Their self-esteem is determined where they are judged to be on the ladders of worldly success. They feel worthwhile as individuals if the members beneath them in achievement, talent, beauty, or intellect are large enough. Pride is ugly. It says, if you succeed, I am a failure. If we love God, do His will, and fear His judgments more than men's, we will have self-esteem. A damning sin. Pride is a damning sin in the true sense of that word. It limits or stops progress. The proud are, are not easily taught. They won't change their minds to accept truths because to do so implies they have been wrong. Pride adversely affects all our relationships, our relationship with God and His servants. Between husband and wife, parent and child, employer and employee, teacher and student, and all mankind, our degree of pride determines how we treat our God and our brothers and our sisters. Christ wants to lift us to where He is. Do we desire to do the same for others? Pride fades our feelings of sonship to God and brotherhood to man. It separates and divides us by ranks according to our riches and our chances for learning. Pride is essentially competitive in nature. We pit ourselves against God, God's. When we direct our pride toward God, it is in the spirit of my will and not thine be done. As Paul said, they seek their own and not the things which are Jesus Christ. Philippians 2.21 our will in competition in God's will allows desires, appetites, and passions to go unbridled. The pride cannot accept the authority of God giving direction to their lives. <coughs> they pit their perceptions of truth against God.